All right, so I prepared too much material, so I'm going to talk too fast. Um, um, so the topic of this, uh, this talk is Java Futures 2019 edition. Thank you for catching the typo, Remy. Um, and this is about where is the Java language going in the next few years. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some things that are about to release and some things that are uh, coming a little bit farther down the road. Uh, I work for Oracle. Everything I say is a lie. Uh, okay. So why do we bother evolving uh, the Java language at all? Uh, Java is, has been around for more than 20 years. Uh, and as Mark said earlier, it's been declared dead over and over and over again. And a lot of people are kind of rooting for Java to be dead. And we plan to confound these expectations, as we have done in the past. Uh, and the way we plan to do that is, is really very straightforward. Stay relevant. Stay relevant to the problems people want to solve. Stay pro relevant to the hardware people want to run on, and keep the promises we made, we've made to our users. Um, so there's no big secret to that. It's, it's just uh, make sure people want to keep using Java because it's the best way to solve their problem. So as you've heard, we've switched to a more rapid release cadence. Um, and that affects the way we evolve the language in some ways that kind of surprised us. Uh, so we obviously have more opportunities to deliver uh, functionality, and that's great. But it's also changed the kind of features that we've been working on. Um, it, it's given us permission to work on some smaller features. When you had a three or four year uh, 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 release cycle, you tended to focus all of your energy on the big stuff, lambdas, generics, modules. And the little stuff just got crowded out. And there are a lot of good little features that are worth doing, but somehow always took second place behind the bigger stuff. And so we found that the, uh, the, the, the six-month cadence has allowed us to balance out uh, working on smaller features and bigger features, uh, I think, in a better way. It's also encouraged us to learn how to, and we're still in the process of learning, break up bigger features into smaller features and do things like lay the groundwork for future features in a current release, like issuing warnings on something that we think may change in the future so that uh, it's less disruptive when the, when, when the change gets there. Um, that said, with more opportunities to release, you have more opportunities to release something too early that you're then stuck with for the rest of time. And so there's also a risk uh, that the uh, new release cadence gives us. And so one of the ways that we want to mitigate that risk is to um, lengthen the pipeline out a little bit. We've shortened the pipeline a lot. We're sort of back backing off a little bit and having each language feature go through a round of what we're calling preview features. So this is a feature that is fully complete, specified, implemented, uh, but the paint's not quite dry. And we want to give ourselves one cycle, maybe two cycles in some cases, to gather feedback from real users uh, to spot things that maybe we missed in our analysis and our initial feedback while we have a chance to make small changes. Uh, and so we're calling these preview features. They're not really just data features. I mean, they're really, the bar for a preview feature is very, very high. It has to be complete. It has to be fully specified. Um, and you, know, you have to have a high degree of confidence that it really is ready. Um, so uh, in, um, in 12, we actually uh, shipped our first preview feature. Uh, there's a lot of projects that are going on in the pipeline. Mark talked about some of these uh, earlier. Uh, there's others that aren't even on the slide. Um, I can't talk about everything that's going on. But, but one of the things that uh, the more rapid cadence has done for us is our pipeline is better than it's ever been. When we were doing multi-year Big Bang releases, when we got to the end of a Java 8, we had kind of spent what we, what we had been working on. And then it was a slow startup process to figure out what we're going to do next. With the more rapid cadence, we're able to uh, balance between short-term and long-term work. And as a result, the pipeline is really fantastic. Um, so uh, Project Amber is uh, the, the sort of umbrella project for the sort of small productivity-oriented language features, uh, a lot of the things that had gotten left left behind by, uh, by the bigger features that we used to work on. I'm going to talk about a couple of those. 
Uh, the, the, um, the first preview feature we're delivering is enhancements to the switch statement. This is also an example of a uh, smaller feature that's sedimented out of a bigger feature. We started looking at the problems of switch when we started looking at pattern matching, which is a bigger feature we'll be working on for a while. And then we realized that some of the pieces could be factored out and delivered earlier and were generally useful uh, not just in the context they were originally designed, but to everybody's code. Um, and uh, so, so this, this, I think this is a success in a couple of ways. And I'll, I'll, I'll run through a quick example of it. It's not, uh, not earth shattering, but it, 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 does, uh, it does address a pain that we sort of all live with every day. So here's a typical switch statement in Java, which is R statements, which means that if you want to um, use a switch to effectively compute a function, you have to cheat by uh, you know, sticking a value in a variable you know, in, in each case, and you better hope that you did, did that for every case. Um, so this is a typical use of a switch to simulate an expression. Uh, it, it stinks in a lot of ways. Uh, it's a overly general control construct, which means, you know, for the problem, which means that it's more error prone. Uh, there's this annoying need to break here. There's this annoying need to say default when we know for a fact that these are the only seven days in the week. Um, it's, it's, not, it, it's not the code you really wanted to write. So there's, uh, there's this operation by mutation, yuck. Uh, there's all there's this strange control flow. Um, you know there's the baking exhaust exhaustiveness in yourself, and this is what it looks like as an expression switch, which is kind of the code you had in your head when you sat down to write this thing in the first place, right? You wanted an expression, you didn't want a statement, and you wanted to be able to say if it's Monday, Friday, or Sunday, then the number of letters is six, and you'd like for the compiler to know that well, day is an enum, you've covered all of them. Why make me write a default clause that throws a, uh, you know? I, I can't find my hat exception when the compiler can darn well put that in for you, right? So this is a simplification in a lot of ways. It's less typing, yay. But the real benefit is, is it's less error prone. It's clearer. It's closer to the code you had in your head when you started. Um, and we've actually done this as two separate enhancements to switch. One is it can either be a statement or an expression. And the other is a sort of a streamlined control flow uh, where uh, in the very common case where each case has one action or one value that's associated with it, uh, there's a simpler control flow where you can just say case value arrow expression or arrow statement and not have to uh, bake back in the, you know, the breaking uh, yourself. Um, oops. OK. Uh, so uh, and you can mix and match these. You could use. One or the other or both. The example I just showed you used both, but you could use uh, the, the, the benefit of the streamlined labels with an ordinary switch statement would fall through if you wanted. OK, so the, uh, the switch expression feature sort of sedimented out of this bigger feature, which, we, which is called pattern matching. Um, pattern matching is a pretty deep feature. I'm not going to be able to do justice to it in the time I have, so I'm just going to uh, try to give you the flavor of it. Um, and an example of something we do all the time is test and extract. Does this object have this characteristic? If so, do, uh, do something to extract a certain value. Cast it to something, pluck out its field, something like that, and put them in variables so I can use them to do something with that. We do these things all the time when we program, and we do them together. And it would be nice to, um, to fuse these into one operation, because they are logically one operation. So when we say if object instance have integer, and the next thing we do is cast it to an integer. That's really disappointing, because what else would we do next? right? Uh, the only thing we could do next is make a mistake by cutting and pasting from somewhere else and casting it to the wrong type. right? So this is not the language helping you write uh, error-free code. It's the language like daring you to make a stupid mistake. right? Um, and so that's not a great way to do things, so let's make that better. Um, there's a lot of ways that this particular problem can be solved. But I think pattern matching is more powerful than, than, than most of the others. Um, and basically, what a pattern match does is it fuses uh, those three things, the test, a conditional extraction, and a binding into one, uh, one operation. And so uh, this is what instance of looks like with a pattern on the right side. Uh, instead of saying instance of integer, we say instance of integer and then a variable name. And that fuses the, are you an integer? If you're an integer, cast it to integer and stick the result in this uh, fresh variable so I can just use it. Right? And 
this is just a very simple kind of pattern. Uh, there, there, um, there are other kinds of patterns, and there are other constructs like switch that can use patterns. So it's a feature that goes pretty deep. But even this simple thing will eliminate like almost 100% of the cast in Java code. So that's pretty nice in and of itself. Um, and and it, 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 it interacts very nicely with Boolean expressions, for example. So if you're writing an equals method, uh, if I say if O instance of this class T, if that succeeds, it binds T, and then I can use it in the remainder of that expression. So if you, if you look at the control flow of an equals method as generated by a typical IDE, it's all over the place. If this, is, if, you know, if this condition is true, then return false. Otherwise, return true. Otherwise, do this complicated thing and return that. It's kind of hard to follow. This is a lot easier to follow. They're equal if the other thing is this class, and his size matches my size, and his name matches my name. Much more clear what's going on. Um, so here's um, uh, another, uh, another example of using pattern matching um, uh, in, in the switch statement. Um, this is the kind of code that we often find ourselves writing. If something's an instance of integer, cast it to an integer to do this. Otherwise, is it a byte? Cast it to a byte, do something else. We've all written this code. Um, and it has, you know, all kinds of repetition. It has the repetition of the test and the cast. It has the repetition of how many times can I say instance of. It has the repetition of assigning to the same variable. And I hope I'm assigning to the same variable in every one of those arms. But the compiler doesn't necessarily check that for me. Um, and if I turn my case label into patterns, some of the boilerplate goes away immediately, which is great. Uh, you know, the, 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 the redundancy of the uh, test and cast go away. And the code is starting to look a little bit more clear. But if I combine it with what I showed you before, which is the uh, switch as an expression, I can write it like this, which is, again, the code you probably had in your head when you sat down to write it. So why not let you actually write that code? So the, um, when you say case pattern, it combines the does the thing match the pattern? If so, extra, um, you know, extract the, the, the relevant stuff for it, bind it to variables that have a scope that makes sense. Okay, so this is a pretty neat feature, and the patterns rabbit hole actually goes pretty deep. I'm not gonna, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna dive into it because I, I would definitely run out of time. But it's definitely something that we can deliver in little bits over time. So we'll do type patterns and instance of first, and then we'll probably do type patterns and switch, and then we'll probably do deconstruction patterns and um, move on from there. So okay, so I'm going to switch gears and talk about a much bigger project that uh, some of you will know that I've been talking about and not delivering for a very long time. And this is the nature of the kind of you know big research and development projects that are reboots to big chunks of the, uh, of the of the platform. We've been working on Valhalla almost five years. We've done five rounds of prototypes. We're we're finally getting close enough to understanding the problem that we think we can transition from the research phase of the program to the development phase of the program. And that's actually pretty good, although some of you are tired of hearing me talk about it. Um, so why is um, Project Valhalla uh, so important? So the goal is rebooting the way the JVM lays out memory, uh, data in memory. And this is important because in the last 25, 30 years, hardware has changed drastically. Um, you know, the relative cost of an arithmetic operation and a memory operation were one to one 30 years ago. And you know, now a full cache mess can cost you 1,000 instruction issue slots. So with the reality changing out from under us by such a degree, it stands to reason the way we were laying things out in memory probably isn't optimal for today's hardware. Um, and you know, if you look at the, uh, the data structures we put in the heap, there's a lot of little nodes with pointers to other nodes. And those pointers mean indirections. Indirections means cache misses. And you know, th that, that is something that you know, has the potential to hurt performance across the board. Um, and the root of this is the philosophy of everything is an object, which made perfect sense in like 1990. Um, but the result is a lot of programs are paying for a benefit they're not getting. So if I have you know, a point class and I have an array of points, this is what it looks like in memory. Each one of those elements of my array is really a pointer to an object with a header and a small payload. And so every, you know, I, I'm using, if you look at, if you look at uh, memory efficiency, I'm losing here because I'm using up a lot of space for headers and arrows uh, compared to the amount of space I'm using for actual XY numbers. And 
I'm, I'm paying in time because as I walk through this list, I'm risking a cache miss every one I look at. Now, sometimes what developers will do when they figure this out is they will like hand shred their code to try to like shred their objects into arrays, which is exactly what we don't want people doing because this kind of code is much harder to maintain, it's less readable, it's more error prone, but it's our fault. It's our fault because we gave developers a choice of either maintainable code or fast code, and developers will always choose the fast code even when their performance, they don't have performance requirements or tests or anything like that. But, you know, so this is the problem that we get. And the fun this fundamentally goes back to every object has an identity. So this is the data layout we want most of the time, right? I have an array of x, y points. I should lay it out in memory, x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y. So the question is, what kind of code do I want to write to get this layout? And our claim is to say that point is a value. A value is an aggregate like a, like a class, but it doesn't have identity. It's just its data. It's just a wrapper for its data. Two points are equal if they have the same x, y value. That's the whole story. And when you tell the VM that, that you don't care about the identity, you're never going to lock on it, you're not going to extend it, you're not going to mutate it, uh, the VM can repay you by saying, aha, I can give you this data layout. In the previous case, the VM always was, set, was guessing of like, well, you haven't locked on it yet, but you might lock on it later. And so it had to pessimistically lay things out in a uh, less than optimal way. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a trade that you're making as a programmer. You're saying, I don't need as much from my object model for this particular class. It's just a dumb numeric class. It's a complex number. And in return for giving up that flexibility, you can be, you know, repaid with better performance. These can be flattened into other objects, other values, into arrays, uh, denser, flatter memory, better performance. Um, so, <laughs> value types kind of have some of the behavior of classes in that they have fields and methods and constructors and type variables and a lot of these things that classes have, but they have the sort of, when, they, when the rubber hits the road, they behave more like primitives. Um, and, you know, this is deliberate. We're trying to get the best of both worlds. And, you know, our, our, our mantra here is codes like a class works like an int. Now, it codes like a restricted form of class. There are things you can't do. But if you can fit within those trade-offs, you can get the benefits. So, okay, who cares? Who's this good for? Well, my claim is this is good for everybody. Uh, if you're writing an application that's working with large data sets, you get, first of all, much better uh, memory density, and second of all, better, uh, better locality. So application writers can more directly control the layout of their code in memory. Uh, library writers can do really cool things with this. We can make hash map faster by using values in the implementation uh, instead of uh, link nodes that are full-blown objects. Um, and so that means every application that uses hash map, which is every application, will just get faster. So that's cool. Um, compiler writers love this. The Scala, you know, th th think of all the stuff that the Scala compiler has to do because it's not exactly like Java and it has to simulate things with objects. Um, you know, Ru uh, Ruby has the same problem. Ruby fixed nums have to be represented as objects. Um, so compiler writers can use this as a compilation target and, you know, uh, languages other than Java on the JVM are probably going to see a much bigger boost from this because right now they're paying an enormous simulation penalty to make their non-Java language work on the JVM. Um, and so I think this is something that's going to make everybody happy, either uh, directly or indirectly. Uh, so like I said, we've been running, uh, running this project you know, for almost five years. Uh, and in that time, we've built uh, five different prototypes, each aimed at answering a different aspect of the question. Let's hold the problem constant except for this little aspect. We'll do a prototype. We'll see what we can learn from that. And uh, the latest prototype, which we're calling um, L World 1, I think we've turned the corner that we've validated the, uh, the VM underpinnings to get us flattened layout, to get us the JIT optimizations, to get us uh, calling convention optimization, scalarization, and enough language support that you can actually write a program that uses these things. Um, so we're hoping that the next prototype um, you know, which is coming, you know, in the next year-ish time frame is something that, you know, people in this room could actually try out and write programs with value types um, and give us feedback. 
So as an example, um, you know, here's an example of, of, of how this pays off. Let's say you want to do matrix multiplication over complex values. So you do it the obvious way. You have a class that represents complex. Uh, you have arrays of complex and two-dimensional arrays of complex to represent matrices. And you write addition and multiplication in the obvious way. And the only thing that's not good about it is look at all that allocation. Right? So you're going to be spending more time allocating than you will be actually multiplying things. And similarly, if you want to implement a matrix multiply, you do it in the obvious way and you pay the obvious penalties. Um, so we, um, we, we, we ran this, uh, both the version I just showed you and the version that was modified by adding one word, which is value, in front of the declaration of a class complex. And we saw a factor of 12 performance difference. Um, and we, now, where did we think that performance difference was going to come from? Well, some of it was not doing boxing at all, and some of it was not doing as much indirection so you could keep your arithmetic pipelines fed with data instead of waiting for data from the cache. And if you look at the instructions per cycle metric, um, you see exactly that. Uh, instructions per cycle in the boxed version was about one on a four-core uh, four uh, uh, machine, and it was almost three. Um, with the value version, which meant that, yes, we were keeping those, um, you know, keeping those uh, arithmetic units fed with data, keeping them busy, and not just having them sit and wait for data coming through the pipeline. So we think this is uh, you know, good validation, that we're moving in the right direction, um, and there's lots more to come here. And uh, so summing up, you know, our pipeline is... It, 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 the only thing I'm sad about is I can't deliver it fast enough. We have all this great stuff we're working on um, in so many categories. Uh, you know, uh, language productivity features, fundamental VM performance features, uh, native interop, uh, concurrency models. Uh, you know, th th these are all starting to bear fruit, you know, uh, and there's really lot, lots of really good stuff coming. So um, next year, I hope to be talking about different stuff, some of the same, but uh, a lot different. So, you know, uh, Come back next year, keep me honest, or better yet, come get involved. Thank you very much. Did I actually talk fast enough to fit that in my budget, or were you just taking pity on me? That was really, really remarkable performance. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have um, a few minutes for questions? Or? Go on, let's have a couple of minutes for questions and then we'll go into the GB meeting. All right. Looks like we have a... Martin. Uh, I'm Joe Java. How do I best help, considering I'm not a VMX, but... You're not Joe Java. <laughs> if you were Joe Java, the question is, how, how can you best help? So um, the, the kind of feedback we need is show up on Amber Dev, Valhalla Dev, try out the prototypes write a toy program and say, this is what I was able to, to get working, this is what I wasn't able to get working. Write tests. Um, you know, identify things that you know, we might have missed. Uh, try, try using these features in your programs, I think, is the best way to do it. You know, cause, cause the, we can think about it and bash our heads against the whiteboard you know, for as long as we want, and we do. But we can't see 100% of the implications. And so we need help from people to point out, here's something I noticed when I actually tried to migrate my code to do that, to use this feature. OK. Um, uh, oh, okay. Well, what's about Project Metropolis? How it's going on? What, what's about? What, so what's Project, about? Project Metropolis. Project Metropolis, okay, so that was one of the features that we didn't have time to even talk about. So Project Metropolis is about uh, adopting components of the Graal project, in particular the Graal JIT compiler and um, using Graal as an AOT compiler into OpenJDK. Um, and so we've got an a experimental version of AOT compilation in the JDK. We have an experimental version of Graal as a JIT compiler in the, in the JDK. Um, and Project Metropolis is about turning these into something that isn't experimental, uh, putting us on a path where it would be credible to replace the C2 compiler with the Graal compiler. We're not there yet, but we hope we'll get there someday. 
Uh, I work in a very big company where Java is very popular and uh, also is very popular and widespread the uses of Lombok, which is a sort of uh, hack to do basic uh, meta programming in Java. Is there any plan to avoid having to use Lombok? Yeah, so, so one of the features I didn't talk about here was, um, for, for want of a better term, algebraic data types. Uh, some in product types, records and sealed types. There's a lot, a lot of different things you can call them. There, there are a lot of things that we do, um, like when we're uh, declaring data wrapper classes that are unnecessary boilerplate. And we care a lot about eliminating that boilerplate, not because we think you should spend less time typing. I mean, you should, but that's not why we do it. It's because uh, having to write all this stuff out longhand that the compiler could figure out on its own is an opportunity for you to make a mistake, right? And so we look at boilerplate reduction not as make my code smaller, but make my code more obvious what it does, make my code less error prone. And we have, that, we, you know, we have a couple of things along those lines in the pipeline. Um, I'm, I was looking at your slide. I think um, would we consider a policy of no preview features on LTS release? They're comp uh, so, so, so preview features in LTS are completely orthogonal. LTS is a support mechanism. Uh, Oracle has happened to decide that, uh, that we're going to make certain support commitments other companies can make their own support commitments. Azul could decide that they're going to support Java 9 for the next 137 years, right? That's, that's a choice they can make. Oracle Probably has, will. Oracle hasn't made that choice. But L LTS is about commercial support. Um, preview features is about not pushing features out before we've gotten enough feedback from people who have used th the feature in anger. They're just, they're just orthogonal. And we don't want to make... Um, uh, feature selection decisions based on what the support model might be for a given version. Thank you very much. Uh, that was justly popular. Thank you.